and welcome to the first episode in our series all about OSLC. My name is Ian Giblet and I'm from Airbus Group Innovations. Collaboration and integration is a huge problem in industry, and especially so in aviation. If you're watching this, you probably already know OSLC is something to do with engineering tool collaboration. Maybe you've been asked by your manager to investigate this OSLC thing. Maybe you've read the specification documents online and don't know where to go next. Well, if that's the case, hopefully this video and the others that follow will be of some use to you. This video will assume that you are already at least familiar with the following concepts. XML, RDF, REST, Linked Data, and HTTP. If not, don't worry. There are already plenty of fine videos on the web addressing these very topics, so they won't be discussed here. So what exactly is OSLC? In its purest form, it is a set of specification documents and it's nothing more. It's not a framework, API or SDK per se, but those do exist. And they exist in other projects, which will be covered in later videos. If you can't wait, then you should investigate the LEO project for Java and OSLC for NET for C Sharp for more information. Anyone can contribute to the OSLC specifications. You just need to sign up, but you don't even need to be a member to use them. A key part of the OSLC is that they are free and open for anyone to make use of. There are, in fact, many specifications for OSLC. The core specification describes the high-level workings of integration. For example, the usage of REST, RDF, HTTP, and so on. They are all described there. All other specifications are derived from the core. The other specifications are domain-specific and cover the areas of requirements, quality, change management, and so on. These specifications give a vocabulary for exchanging concepts in your specific domain. For example, the requirements specification, the concept of a requirement is defined here, along with attributes, such as the name, description, what it satisfies, and so on. What happens, though, if your domain isn't covered? Well, that's okay. You can still use the core specification and define yourself the concepts that you wish to exchange for your specific use case. Maybe at a later stage, you could formalize your concepts into your own specification and propose them to OSLC as a new domain. After all, it's a completely open consortium. So let's start with the basic structure. In OSLC, you have two types of tools, consumers and providers. Providers exist to distribute the resources via HTTP. These resources will typically be sent in RDF XML, but be aware that other formats do exist. Providers just sit there and wait for requests from consumers. Consumer applications, they request the information, but not only that, they can also create resources on the service providers, update them, delete them, and so on. This model shows a nice overview of all the services available to you. Let's start with the service provider. The vast majority of engineering tools have some concept of partitioning to store your data. They can be known as projects, modules, user databases, folders, and so on and so on. There is no agreement on the name, but there is an agreement that they do exist and they are important. The two things that a service provider should seek to answer is, which URL can I use to post new resources? And which URL can I use to get a list of resources? Note, a common misunderstanding is that a service provider represents a tool. It does not. A service provider represents a container, usually for each project. So it's quite likely that you can have multiple service providers per tool. Next on the list, we have the service provider catalog. This should serve as an entry point into an application that wishes to locate services and resources from a service provider. Note, in the IBM implementations of OSLC, there is an entry point which comes even earlier, and this is known as the root services. In OSLC, a set of capabilities which are available to you are called services. These are the abilities to create, update, delete resources, and so on. Another service which is available to you sometimes is called the delegated UI, which might be given by an OSLC service provider. The query capability performs queries. A query capability gives you a base URI for forming your queries. Using it by itself would provide a potentially huge list of resources, and as such, it is more likely that you would use it with a set of filters. For example, how many change requests were raised last week by Julie? A query resource can be thought of as the RDF XML that you get back after you perform an HTTP GET on a query. 
a query URL is the base query URI as retrieved from the query capability with filter criteria appended to the end. The creation factory provides a URI to which someone can post to create new resources. To learn what a resource would look like before you do the post, you have two options. You can read the OSLC specification for the resources you are dealing with, or you can study the resource shape which is given to you by the service provider. The resource shape defines a set of OSLC properties expected of a resource. These resources can then be used in certain operations, creating, updating, deleting, and so on. The resource shape describes a resource and its cardinality with other resources. It lays out all of the properties of a resource and whether they are optional or mandatory. For example, someone using a creation factory would be interested in the resource shape because it would help them understand what resources can be posted to it. Another example might be someone dealing with queries. The resource shape tells the consumer which property values are there to be queried. So far, to access the features that I've described, you would have to do so programmatically. The operations that I've talked about would typically be done by software applications sending and receiving HTTP commands. And no end user would ever work like that, unless they're perhaps a software developer and they're debugging. With the delegated UI, it is possible for an OSLC service provider to give the consumers the ability to perform some actions without ever having to write a line of code. The delegated UI works by providing an interface to the consumer, which allows the end user to select or create new resources. For example, when you perform a GET on a delegated UI for selection, you get back the HTML code of a form that allows you to browse resources. This code can then simply be loaded into a web browser, and the end user will be provided with a form which they can use to browse their resources. To conclude, I would like to say two things about OSLC. The first is that just because OSLC is powered by web technology, don't just assume that your data is stored on a cloud. It might well be the case, but ultimately it's down to each tool to be responsible for its own data. There will definitely be more information contained within each development tool that OSLC does not expose, and that's fine. It's not needed for collaboration. Secondly, the power of OSLC is that it gives you the ability to control software applications without knowing the inner workings of each tool. Maybe the software is written in Java or C++. Maybe the tool stores its data as a CSV file or in an Oracle database somewhere. The point is, you just don't care. So long as OSLC is implemented, you know you'll be able to access and update that tool's resources. All you would need to know in advance is the URI of the service provider catalog. Thanks for watching. If you have any further questions, please get in touch. Bye-bye.